Running, especially the marathon, is really hard, no matter how fast or slow you're doing it. Like it's, um, it's inherently a difficult task, even if you walk a marathon 26 miles, that's a long ways. I know the Olympics is a huge stage, but my goal isn't like inherently more important than other people's goals. The point of our training is to get ready for the race. Are there kind of mileage goals in there? Yeah. Are there certain workouts that we really feel like we have to hit? Yeah, but it's always with the end goal of doing as well as we can at the race. It's not like a, a puzzle where these pieces have to fit here, here, and here, and here. This has to kind of be like a, a piece of art. So I have been having to describe the trials to like coworkers who, I tell them I'm doing the Olympic marathon trials and they, immediately say, oh, you're going to the Olympics? So the Olympic Marathon Trials race is held every year of an Olympic cycle. The Olympic Marathon Trials are the race that determines the United States Olympic team. First three runners across the line make the team. It's one of the most energetic and talked about running events during an Olympic year. So this year it'll be in Atlanta. The course is gonna be hilly. There's about 1,300 feet of gain and loss. It's not hilly if you think of it from a trail running perspective, but it's a challenging distance. No matter how well trained you are, it's hard to run 26.2 miles. I think it's probably the deepest the American Marathon has ever been. There are four, I think, probably heavy favorites, including myself, and then there's probably 15 or 16 guys who have a legitimate shot to make the team behind that. I'm very unlikely to make the Olympic team because I'm not a professional marathoner. There's a huge field of really fast women who have pushed themselves to reach this goal. Women who are not career athletes, they have jobs, they have children. So it's gonna be deep, it's gonna be really hard, there's gonna be a lot of pressure, but I like the big stages and I like the competition and I like that the training is all leading to this. There was doubt, of course, but I think the desire to be a professional runner has been there for a very long time. I started running at a young age and immediately really liked it. I think the reason why I love it, the thing that I, that kind of like drives me is like the freedom, I guess, like just doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. At first it was because I was good at it. I think when you're young, you tend to like things that you can beat people in and you can be very good at. I'd been really good in high school. I'd made Foot Locker and state champ and I really hadn't faced any like adversity or roadblocks in terms of my progression as a runner. I'd just gotten better every year. Went to college at the University of Portland. The first year I came to college was rough. Uh, now all of a sudden I was, you know, 18, training with 23 year olds, you know, all Americans and I was not the best anymore. Uh, and that was difficult for me to deal with. The combination of that and immediately having access to a lot of free beer and shitty food and uh, <laughs> no one telling me to go to bed. And like I leaned into that freedom a little bit too hard. Uh, I was pretty fried. And I remember thinking like, this is so dumb. Like, why am I putting myself through this? So I decided that, look, I was gonna give this another shot. I was gonna focus more on running. And if it was still not going well, uh, I decided I was gonna quit because it wasn't fun. And it turns out when you take care of your body, running becomes a lot more fun. I really wanted to be a professional runner, but I didn't know if I was gonna be able to. I was kind of good enough to get in the door, but not really good enough to earn like a salary. Moved to Flagstaff in 2015 to train with Hoka and AZ Elite. The turning point there was 2016, the Stanford 10K. Ran a 45 second PR, got third almost hit the Olympic standard, and then I went on to eventually get fourth at the Olympic trials. I was not good enough to make the Olympic team on that day. I just, I simply wasn't. Um, I got beat by three guys who were fitter and stronger and better than me on the day. And um, that really sucked. <laughs> I've had a lot of races where I don't feel like I made any mistakes, where I felt like I put myself all the way out there, I trained well, and I didn't win. And I will continue to have races like that. That happens a lot. I found a way to take pride in my best. Um, because at some point, 
you really have to figure out a way to be okay with not winning races you're not good enough to win or else you're going to have a pretty short career. The motivation to move to the marathon, it was pretty clear that I was going to be really good at it. I wanted to do my best event during my physical prime and it made sense to move up in 2017. You know, I've had a few good accomplishments. Uh, seventh at New York City Marathon, seventh at Boston, ran 209.09. I knew I was capable of something like that at Boston. I guess you would have to kind of say it was a breakthrough since, I mean, it was a three and a half minute PR. It felt so natural to be there. I'm in this sport for the racing. I, I love the training. It's great that that's my job, that I get to go do that. But, you know, we train to race. I like the big stages and I like the competition and I like um, seeing how far I can push myself. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to try to beat really good people as well. Like, I want to win the Olympic trials. Um, so this is an opportunity to try to get the best out of myself and uh, try to really accomplish something. The training is going to be hard. It's important to know what's coming. And if you train well, you should kind of know what's coming. Just this last year, we've seen like a real boon, I guess, in American distance running. I think people are figuring out how to train for the marathon. It's the biggest thing, like, people are gonna say it's the advances in shoes, and people understand now that you've gotta put in a lot of miles, you've gotta do a lot of really specific work. So, you know, long sessions, running marathon pace at the end of runs. If there's gonna be hills on the course, you have to do hills too. So you can't fake the distance. Um, you have to do your long runs especially if you're doing your first marathon. If you didn't quite get in the speed workouts that you wanted, that's going to be just fine. But if you haven't done your long runs, that's going to be trouble. I like track because it doesn't lie. Like you can look at a GPS and like maybe it's off. You know, you're like, well, it just wasn't quite dinging the satellites right today. Doing track workouts, you know like exactly what splits equate to what mile pace that really pushes me into kind of that anaerobic like area where it's like hard to breathe and you feel that burning in your lungs and it almost feels like that feeling like after a good cry where you're like empty and just at the same time like so filled up with emotion. I think one of the strengths that I have as a trail runner is I'm used to fluctuations in terrain. So I run most of my races on the trails by effort, not by pace on watch. And so I know what marathon effort should feel like, and that's what I'm gonna key off of versus like aiming for a specific pace. It's important to practice fueling during practice. You don't want all that work to be for naught because you didn't have enough gels or didn't drink enough or drank too much. Easy runs, I typically don't take any nutrition during the run, but it is an opportunity to practice what you can eat before a run. Because I'm always looking for if I can eat more calories since I run pretty early in the morning. That can be a challenge. I'm no Scott Phelps. This is the extent <laughs> of my warm-up routine. <laughs> Typical day, you know, I wake up two hours before practice. For easy runs, it's nothing special. Uh, I just have a cup of coffee, a piece of toast with peanut butter, and a s'mores stroop waffle. And then for a workout, I will always have a breakfast I know will work, which is coffee and a stroop waffle. <laughs> and then I will take gels with me for the workout. I'll practice taking one or two gels during the workout. And you know, it's really practicing getting it out of your pocket, opening it while you're running fast, eating it, you know, not throwing the trash away as litter. But <laughs> and I always practice with the flavors I'm actually going to use on race day. <laughs> Having electrolyte or calorie drink on top of the gels is too much for me to digest. Um, especially at the effort level that the marathon is going to be in. Not all flavors are going to agree with you. Not all combinations of gel and fluids are going to agree with you. Find your go-tos and stick with it until you're sick of it and then find something else. For a long run, I really try to practice keeping track of how many calories I'm consuming. So for our long runs and oftentimes our workouts, we try to fuel as specific to the race as we can. Uh, for the longer stuff, I like to uh, drink the Summit Tea Rock Chain. Just for marathon training, my metabolism is like shot through the roof where I'm getting hungry like every three hours. So having the protein recovery drink 
with some ice water that I can keep in my car has been really helpful just to kind of supplement those calories right when I finish a run and then have a real meal when I get home. Usually I'll have a lunch of like crackers and hummus and carrots and I'll have a, another cup of coffee and a stroop waffle usually before my second run. Come back and have a little snack and then I'll have dinner and kind of try to eat well. Plenty of vegetables, try to eat all the colors, plenty of protein and meat. It's also really important to have more of that whole food throughout the day. That's ultimately what's going to set you up for success. By the time you get to race weekend, you should know the shoes you're going to wear, the socks you're going to wear, your nutrition plan has to be dialed in. It's not like a logistically easy thing to get enough calories during a marathon and you kind of have to plan out and eat on regular intervals. I try to go every 45 minutes, although sometimes it depends how I feel. If I can tell that I'm starting to feel low on energy, I'll just take another gel. At the trials, the tables will be every four miles. I will probably have a gel right at the start and then another gel at halfway. And in between, I'll be drinking uh, Roctane. Know how fast your body tends to go through calories. Like elite marathoners might not need as much fuel because they're finishing the race in two and a half hours versus the four hours that it might take an average person to do a marathon. Get everything dialed in in practice. And once you get to the marathon, there should be like no more big decisions. You should have it all figured out. I do remember the first serious run I ever went on. I was in college at MIT in Cambridge and I had decided that I wanted to run the Boston Marathon. And I Googled how to run a marathon <laughs> and left my dorm with, you know, totally inappropriate shoes and tried to just run to Harvard Bridge. I think I made it to the bridge, but definitely not all the way across the bridge. And I thought, running's really hard. <laughs> Running was purely a hobby. I wanted to do Boston because it looked really fun and it would be, you know, a way to get some exercise and get outside in the midst of doing all this schoolwork. I ended up spending a few months training to run my qualifier race for Boston and I ran fast enough um, I always saw Boston as kind of the end goal of marathoning. I just wanted to do it. Turns out I got addicted to marathoning. <laughs> I love the process of having a goal and then I love the challenge of figuring it out. It takes a tremendous amount of determination, work and patience to reach goals in a sport like running. So I love the exercise in grit, really. After a few years of seeing improvement in my times, I was getting more and more competitive with myself. And at that point, I thought, hey, let's try to be pretty serious about running and get after the Olympic trials qualifying time, which was 2.46. And I ran 2.46.40, which does not make the qualifying standard. I kind of regrouped after that race and raced again three months later in Minnesota and ended up running my PR, which is still my PR, of 2.38. Um, so I went to the 2012 trials. I didn't have a good race because I was dealing with some high hamstring tendonitis. I didn't go for the 2016 trials because I'd really started my ultra running career at that point. Once I got fit enough and fast enough to be able to win races, I really fell into being super competitive. Like, I wanted to win. I ended up running a marathon in 2018 because the TNF 50 was canceled that year due to the wildfires. And so sort of shifted gears, we had a crash course in marathon training for about, I think we had four weeks between TNF and CIM. So I think I did two tempo runs and then lined up for the marathon. Um, but fitness is fitness, as my coach Mario would say. My goal was to run 242 and I ended up running 239. And I think having the strength from all of the 50 mile training um, really helped me on that day to run uh, fast enough to qualify again for the trials in 2020. Brian Powell of I Run Far here with the O Wang after a win at the 2019 TNF 50. Uh, after this, I'm going to take a few weeks off and then start December ramping up for the marathon trials okay. in Atlanta. So I would have never predicted that I would 
one, still be running and also be running at this level. Discomfort is an inherent part of any endeavor where you're trying to get the absolute most out of yourself. You can't block out pain. It's your body's natural response to like pushing it beyond homeostasis. If you try to block it out, that's just a waste of energy. I feel like one thing that I've done well in terms of managing pain from a general level is accepting that it's going to be there. When it comes, I don't try to block it out. I just let it in. But if you let it in, if you accept that it's coming, you can be in charge and it gets to come and it's gonna ride in the car but it doesn't get to drive and it can't pick the music no matter how much pain you're in a it's finite when in running like it will end and b y you can endure more of it than you think you can i started meditating in college so i was having some pretty severe anxiety issues and went into the mental health center we kind of figured out that this was a practice that was gonna that was gonna help, and it started really for therapeutic reasons. And even now, like I don't meditate necessarily in like a structured way that is inherently designed to enhance performance. Um, I just do it because when I do it, I feel great, and when I don't, I don't feel so good. So you know, my practice is just sitting down for 15 minutes in the morning, and on good days, I can sit down for another five or 10 minutes in the afternoon. Mindfulness has a way of kind of seeping into the rest of your life when you when you start practicing it. I'm not like writing the whole story of the race all at once. I can kind of just focus on being present as opposed to kind of freaking out when I have a bad mile or when I'm not feeling very good. You have to embrace a certain level of pain, but also know how much pain is too much pain and how much pain is good pain versus bad pain. So there's the pain that comes with pushing yourself in a workout or in a race versus like, oh, I'm gonna pull a hamstring kind of pain. Finding a good physical therapist, chiropractor or massage therapist would be my next piece of advice. People are so willing to spend money on all these kind of unproven tools or like these fancy new shoes or whatever. But as soon as their like knee hurts, they're like, I'll just figure it out. And it's like, there are actually people who go to school for many years to understand and diagnose and help people with this very issue. Ultra running is basically Ellie's job security because it breaks people and causes them to need physical therapy. So I made her a shirt that said that and gave it to her after Western States this year. I always have a standing appointment with her, pretty much monthly at the very least. You know, I kind of use that as my check-in because she can kind of see how my body's moving in ways that I don't see. The most beneficial thing you can do for running um, other than running more miles is sleep. People will spend all this money on recovery techniques but they're getting like five and a half hours of sleep a night and like if you can get eight to nine hours of sleep a night that's going to be way more beneficial than uh, any stick or massage gun. I try to be very in tune with how my body is feeling. Everyone throughout the course of the training cycle has injuries or they have personal things come up and you have to be able to be flexible and to problem solve. Yeah, in 1992, my mom was nine months pregnant. That year, um, Western States started on June 27th. My dad got in, even back then it was a lottery and really wanted to do it. I'm the fourth child in my family, so I guess maybe he was like, it'll be fine. So I was born at 2 p.m. on the Sunday of Western States weekend. He had finished the race, but he missed my birth. He met me when I was like six hours old or something that evening. So my dad got me into running. He really kind of opened my eyes to the sport and kind of what a small group of people think is fun and acceptable to do on a weekend. I kind of started off just doing like, you know, middle, high school, cross country track. As I got a little older, I loved jumping in trail races. I ran at Portland State University and um, specialized in the 10K there. When I was a sophomore in college, watching the trials on TV, and I remember um, seeing Jen Sheldon. She was kind of an acquaintance from growing up in Ashland. During that time, she was 
one of the best ultra marathoners in the US. And I was like, that's pretty cool that she has like done so well in the trail world. And she's also crossing over to do this landmark marathon on the road. Over the past couple years with running taking kind of more of a focus in my life, I definitely love jumping on the Western States kind of bandwagon. It's always been a goal of mine. Placing top 10 the past couple years has been really exciting. But regardless, even when I'm doing ultra marathons, I still keep up the speed work. My kicking ability at Western States has come in handy. My experience running a few hundred miler races now like makes running a marathon seem a lot easier. But there's something to be said for making it to the Olympic trials. It's an equalizer of a lot of factors. Um, in 2018, I had gotten married. And so on my honeymoon, I like got thoroughly out of shape. It was great. So, I mean, I couldn't even hit marathon pace going like mile or two mile repeats. So I did train my butt off to get to where I wanted to be for CIM. It was kind of a freak, like successful race, but that's also just kind of my style. And so for me, even though it's not my specialty, it's a proving ground showing that even though I tend to focus my fitness and energy on trails and mountains and crazy long distances, that doesn't mean that I'm not fit and just as competitive as other women who are training just as hard. Running is just like one part of my life. My profession as a social worker is really important to me. I have a very interesting schedule. I actually work nights, working three 12-hour shifts from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., getting off, sleeping for six to seven hours during the day, waking up around three or four in the afternoon, going for usually just an easy run on my um, work days, quick dinner and going back to work. Just get out the door. That's all I can say. If you prioritize running, everything else tends to fall in place. I think it's important to set boundaries around your time. So I get a lot of requests from both the running side of the job that I have and from being a teacher. You know, I get invited to a lot of races and I usually always say no because I want to do the races that I can fully you know, dedicate myself to preparing for. And then with work things, it can be really hard because you're dealing with students and you never want to, you know, let anyone down. I'm very clear, like when I'm on campus and when I'm not, I don't open my work email on the weekend. <laughs> um, so I think giving yourself permission to set those boundaries is the only way that you can balance a lot of different interests or jobs or passions. Quiz on this next week. <laughs> it, this is a sport that can get lonely if, if you kind of let it. There's a lot of stuff that you can do alone, but it's nice to have teammates. So NAZ Elite is a professional running group. There's about 12 of us. We all have the same coach, uh, meet up five or six times a week, plus two weight sessions. So we see a lot of each other. Having people to support and be supported by is one of the reasons we've kind of like had so much success. I think we all know that it's gonna be decided on race day. Like we don't need to beat each other into the ground now. Working together will get us on it from an individual perspective to the highest point we can get to. Find a community around it. You're gonna be able to get through the training runs a lot easier if you just make plans to meet up with someone. Um, because at the end of the day, the people that you're racing could also be your very best friends and training partners. And so that spirit of competition should be, let's all raise each other up. I think I am really looking forward to celebrating running at this event. I, I want to run around 240. I will be happy if I can do that because it's quite a hilly and challenging course. And then I want to really have had fun with the experience. I think that's most important with any kind of running or racing that you do. I want to know that I tried my absolute best. I set kind of an arbitrary goal when I qualified that I wanted to place top 10%. 
I think that that still is going to be a really tough goal. And I hope that it's an experience that I can tell my family, my grandkids, my nieces and nephews about. I am not approaching this with the goal of making the team. I'm approaching it with the goal of, of winning. But the Olympics is a huge stage. It would be an absolute honor. Not many people get to do it. One mistake I could make is thinking about this like it's all or nothing. Most people fail at something. There are people who miss the Olympic trials by one second, or people who miss a Boston qualifier by two seconds. That happens every single day. It will really suck at the moment if I don't make the Olympic team, but my girlfriend will still be there, my family will still be there, my friends will still care about me, and I will still have an opportunity to be a professional runner. I think remembering that is actually a motivating factor. It means I'm, I'm free to go all out. Like, I don't have to hold anything back. With the faith that if we do that, and if we execute a kind of all the little steps along the way, the picture will reveal itself at the end.